Chad AC Show, News Talk, 95.1 FM, 790 AM KFYO. Welcome back. Joining me on the phones right now, Republican strategist Matt Mikoviak. Matt, good morning. How are you today? I'm doing great, Chad. Good morning. Well, Matt, uh, we finally have uh, at least one announced Democrat uh, to take on uh, Senator John Cornyn in the upcoming election. Uh, MJ Hager announcing uh, today via video that uh, she's running uh, uh, for, against uh, John Cornyn if she can get through the Democrat primary. Uh, for folks who don't know much about her, uh, and there are probably a lot of people outside of, of, of the, the Round Rock area who don't know about her, what do we need to know? Yeah, um, you know, she was one of the uh, overperforming congressional candidates on the Democratic side in uh, 2018. Uh, she's a military veteran. She was a helicopter pilot, um, ran against Congressman John Carter in Central Texas, uh, and lost by I think just under three percent in a district that had been had been considered pretty Republican. Um, she became uh, something of a celebrity because she had a, an ad called Doors that kind of went viral with something like two million views um, in the you know initial days, kind of right after it got released, uh, kind of about her biography. She has a, uh, tattoos on one of her arms, uh, makes her kind of a bit of an unusual you know candidate. Um, and you know I, I'm always amazed when someone runs for one office at one level, loses, and then runs for a higher office. Uh, it makes you kind of wonder. Uh, what you know? What kind of uh, calculus you know that person uh, is engaging in? Um, I think that ultimately what happened here is um, Joaquin Castro, the congressman from uh, San Antonio, whose brother Julian was mayor of San Antonio, is running for president, uh, made a lot of noise and, and made it sound like he wanted to challenge John Cornyn, and for whatever reason, Democrats didn't think that would be a good idea. And so they sort of tried to recruit someone else, and that's where MJ Hager has come in. She's apparently been recruited by Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer of New York, and um, she appears, you know, serious about running. I will say about the, the announcement video, which was highly produced, um, I, I thought there were a couple parts of it that probably won't ring all that uh, true to most Texans. Uh, she highlighted a number of liberal celebrities who called attention to that viral ad last year. Um, you know, Texas isn't all that interested in, in Hollywood celebrities. Uh, and then she, for some reason, chose to uh, highlight uh, Beto O'Rourke uh, uh, using the using a an, an expletive yeah. uh, at a at a campaign event. Which again, I don't understand why you do that. In a and then she re- went right into yeah. like Texas values, like right after that yeah. she highlighted and applauded him for dropping the f bomb on TV. She yeah. talked about Texas values, and and that that was kind of a head scratcher for me. Yeah, I thought I thought that, that parts of it were a bit tone deaf. Um, I think she she's going to try to basically recreate Beto's magic uh, in this Senate race. I think she wants to be, you know, a national candidate raising national money. Um, you know, the challenge I think she's going to have is that it's going to be very hard uh, with the presidential race going on to break through. Uh, and there are four or five, who knows, maybe eight U.S. Senate races that are going to be closer than Texas. Um, you know, that could legitimately flip. I mean, Iowa, uh, you know, Alabama, Maine, um, you know, they're, they're Colorado. I mean, there's a lot of action out there. So we'll see whether she can kind of create the Beto magic. I, I tend to doubt it. Um, I think in some places she may overperform. And she's a serious candidate, and the Corn team will take her very seriously. But um, I have trouble seeing how she can scale and become a, a truly a statewide candidate when she wasn't even able to, to win a congressional race. Well, and we're visiting with Matt Mikoviak, and you brought up something very interesting uh, early on that uh, she had lost her race by just under three uh, percentage points. As, yeah. as we all know, Beto O'Rourke came within 2.6 percentage points uh, of beating yeah. Ted Cruz. So was, best you can tell, was she riding Beto's coattails uh, in her race, or did... What, did she do enough herself to pull within uh, that close of a margin uh, of taking down a Republican? It's a good question. Um, you know, uh, Beto was able to flip Williamson County, which is just north of Austin, uh, which is really pretty striking uh, that he was able to do that. Um, that was not because of MJ Hager. That was because of him. Um, and and that, that congressional district that she ran in was Bell County, which is Temple and Belton, very military-heavy kind of area, veteran-heavy. 
uh, and Williamson. So, you know, you could argue that, 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 you know, a large part of her success in that race was, was, was um, driven by, by Beto due to her success, his success in, in Williamson County, which transferred down to her. Um, but, again, I mean, I don't want to pretend like she didn't run a real race and wasn't a real candidate, because she was. I mean, she got, again, a lot of attention, raised a lot of money, a significant amount of money for a first-time candidate, um, you know, had, had very successful ads. Um, I just think the challenge she's going to have is that um, not only is she going to have trouble scaling to, to becoming a statewide candidate, and not only is it a much more competitive fundraising environment, but she's also, you know, again, fairly liberal. Um, she, she may sort of, you know, talk like a moderate in some ways, but she is not a moderate candidate, and I think Cornyn is going to make sure Texans understand that she's a pretty liberal, she would be a very liberal senator from a pretty conservative state. Yeah. Now, she has to make it through a Democrat primary, which could feature Joaquin Castro. Do you think he runs, and it, if, if he does, how, how bruising of a primary could that be between those two? Yeah, no, I don't think he runs. Uh, you know, you got to kind of think about it from his perspective. Um, the, you know, he's in a he's in a safe congressional seat, um, seat that Charlie Gonzalez held for for decades. I think his father held it before that. Um, you know, and he's now in the majority, and he's on the House Intelligence Committee. And so, I just don't don't see him giving up everything he's built um, to to run a one in five or one in ten race for the United States Senate, particularly not now that Democrats have recruited someone that they want to run. Um, I guess he could, you know, could could challenge her. And if he did, I, I would actually think he'd be more likely to win the Democratic primary than she would. Uh, but, yes, I think it probably, if they were to both run, could it get – Nasty. I guess it's possible. Um, I, you know, I don't know. I think they'd be running on different biographies. Certainly, yeah. I don't know what their the, the big the big challenge the big differences in kind of their issues would be. We'd have to see that. But I think what's interesting here is you know Joaquin was sort of seen as the front runner uh, challenger to Cornyn, and he really kind of you know let the last couple of months get away from him. Uh, he's been probably focused to some extent on Julian's presidential campaign, which is really not getting any traction or attention. So it's interesting that, you know, he really wants to be a national figure, um, and he just hasn't been able to really figure out a way to do that, just like his brother hasn't. So M.J. Hager was able to sort of sneak ahead of uh, ahead of uh, Joaquin. Uh, I think, again, that's because Democrats would rather have her run against Cornyn uh, than Joaquin Castro. Yeah. Uh, last night, CNN had a five-hour marathon session of town halls with the uh, Democrats. Uh, yeah. It, anything that you took away uh, from last night or maybe that you found surprising uh, about last night's town halls? I, you know, maybe two things. Um, you know, I think uh, number one, I think Bernie Sanders created a problem for himself by arguing that that uh, felons should be able to vote while in prison. Yeah, uh, and I think he was asked specifically about the Boston uh, m- m- Marathon bomber. Um, so that's that's not going to play well in New Hampshire. Well, and and, sure. and and Matt, here's what was interesting about that. Not only was he yeah. asked about that, the the crowd was pretty quiet when he gave his answer, yeah. and then yeah. when Pete Buttigieg got up there. Yeah. And and they asked him the same question. He said, while they're in prison? And and, and Anderson Cooper said, yes. Uh, Buddha Judge said, no. No, I don't think so. Right. And everybody clapped in the audience. Yeah, that's right. I was going to point that out, too. You know, um, it, it, And that was interesting because I, I haven't seen a lot of instances where Buddha Judge has kind of gone against liberal orthodoxy. Um, so in this case, you know, I, you know, I don't know if we want to call that a sister soldier moment, um, because I think 90 percent of the country believes felons shouldn't be voting uh, while they're in prison. Um, but I think it does show that you know that you, ha- you have some candidates on the Democratic side that are you know kind of uh, willing to just say really ridiculous and extreme things at times and really be kind of reckless. I mean, I think Kamala Harris was asked the same question and. She said something about how we need to have a national conversation about that mm-hmm. issue, and she said something like that, said that four or five different times uh, throughout that hour-long uh, uh, town hall. So, yeah, look, I mean, I don't know. I don't know about you. I'm kind of tired of these town halls. Um, they just it happen every week. Um, it it just seems seems to never end. I mean, I think the good news is we are learning some things about some of these candidates, where they stand, um, you know, kind of uh, how they're going to perform in these kinds of settings. But... Um, you know, to me, I, I think that was the biggest headline from yesterday. Um, I, I don't know. I, look, Bernie, I think, is – Bernie understands he cannot simply have the support of white voters or he's not going to be the nominee. And so he's making real strides to try to attract African-American and Hispanic support. And I think in some some way maybe he thought this could do that. But, boy, it felt, felt like a false note to me. Yeah. I uh, visit with Matt McCovey. I, Matt, before I let you go, just w- w- one more thing on that on the CNN town halls yesterday. One – 
I thought that Klobuchar was horrible. Uh, that she looked the most uncomfortable just being up yeah. on that stage. Uh, Bernie was Bernie. Kamala wants to have a national discussion on everything. Buddha judge, and, and I, I know he's rising in the polls, and he's probably just that flash in the pan type candidate. But he's one of these candidates that I think should worry people in the future because he comes across as, you know, the Midwestern. Because yeah, he's from South Bend, Indiana. He you know, he comes across you know Midwestern. Hey, uh, you don't need to worry. I'm not as liberal as everybody else, but he is. But he doesn't right. come across that way. No, that's right. And um, and you know, sort of convincing people that you're you're reasonable can be a real strength, um, you know, in, in a general election. Uh, and you know, it, it, it does puzzle me because he did run for treasurer in Indiana. Um, I'm forgetting the year, but I want to say it was 2010 against Richard Murdoch, and and he lost by a really large margin. Now, God, God knows how old he would have been at that time, um, 30, you know, 31 or something like that, but uh, or 30, but. So, you know, so, but you're right. I mean, look, Pete he, he has a couple of things going for him. I think number one is he's very different from almost every other candidate that's running, and being unique is a strength. I think number two, uh, he obviously clearly he clearly has you know sort of natural talent, right? I mean, he's just he's he's likable, he's got charisma. Uh, it seems he's very authentic. You know, it's it's sometimes it's hard to have both charisma and authenticity, yeah. right? You can have sort of one or the other, but he seems to have both. Um, number three, he's got an impressive biography. I think we have to be honest about that, right? Road scholar, military veteran, mayor of a small town, went home, you know, that kind of thing. Um, again, I still have to wonder whether he can really become the nominee. I, I just think scaling and becoming that front runner, that, that, that nominee in the Democratic Party, when the stakes are so high and they desperately want to beat Donald Trump, I have to wonder whether they're really going to bet the house on a 37-year-old who's mayor of the fourth largest city in Indiana, uh, right? I just have to wonder whether the, he's ultimately going to get there. But to your point, I think he is going to be a factor in the future of the Democratic Party. Uh, maybe he could be on the ticket, maybe be in the cabinet. Who knows what you know where he, where he ends up. He clearly is overperforming in this primary, and he is clearly taking the wind out of the sails of Beto O'Rourke. He's the one going viral. I mean, he's the Beto of this field, basically, right now, and uh, that's preventing Beto from, from getting much attention. Yeah. Matt, tell folks how they can sign up for your newsletter and uh, what your latest uh, podcast episode is on. Yeah, thanks. Uh, the newsletter, we take all the news from around the state of Texas, put it into one uh, easy-to-read, uh, clean email each weekday morning. It's called Must Read Texas. We've got over 3,000 subscribers. You can sign up for a free one-week trial at mustreadtexas.com. And the podcast is called Mac on Politics. It's available everywhere you find podcasts, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, and at MacOnPoliticsPodcast.com. Last two episodes are a dissection of the Mueller report, uh, first with uh, a senior editor from The Federalist named David Harsani, uh, and then most recently with Jim Trusty, who was a senior DOJ official and a former assistant U.S. attorney. So you can check that out. All right, Matt, as always, appreciate your time. Thanks, Chad. Take care. Have a good one. It's Matt McCoviak, Chad H.T. Show, News Talk, KFYO.